All right, we have Patrick McEwen, actually Professor Patrick McEwen from uh, the Buteco Clinics and the breathing professor that is my go-to practitioner. It's been a privilege to read his book, eight best-selling books, and I'm so grateful for your time, Patrick. I know that you're a busy, busy practitioner heading up clinics uh, in the UK. You've just been on a podcast this morning. You've been uh, on, going on a podcast this afternoon, and I want to talk about breathing and how important it is. Uh, we can go without food for weeks, uh, without water for days, but just uh, minutes without breathing correctly and having the correct oxygen levels. So I do want to give the Facebook Live streamers and Facebook, uh, you know, just a start straight away. Why is breathing so important? And one breathing technique we can start right now to introduce people into this topic of breathing and how important it is. Well, quite simply, you change your breathing patterns, you can improve blood flow and you're going to increase oxygen delivery to the tissues. And you're going to start practicing this, focusing on the air flowing into the nose and the air as it leaves your nose, and gently slow down the speed of your breathing. So as you feel the air flow coming into your nose, and as you feel the air flow leaving your nose, gently slow down the speed of the breath and breathe almost that you're feeling hardly any air coming into your nose. So as you breathe in, Slow down the speed of your breath so much by focusing on the airflow coming into the nose and slowing it down almost that you feel hardly any air coming into your nose. And at the top of the breath, bring a total feeling of relaxation to the body and allow the air to leave the body effortlessly and naturally. Allow your breathing to soften to the point that you are breathing less air than what you were breathing before you started. You are doing it correctly when you feel air hunger and the feeling of air hunger should be tolerable. And if you do it for about three to four minutes, start paying attention to the temperature, the internal temperature of your fingers, your, maybe your feet, your body. Pay attention to the saliva in your mouth and pay attention to your state of mental alertness. When you reduce breathing volume by slowing down the breath to take less air into the lungs, carbon dioxide will gently accumulate in the blood and carbon dioxide is not just that waste gas. One of the functions of carbon dioxide is it's a vasodilator. So by breathing less air, your blood vessels open up. And conversely, people who breathe poorly, they often experience cold hands, cold feet, and brain fog. Cold hands because of impaired circulation. However, breathing with poor breathing patterns and breathing in excess of what we should be it's not just reducing blood flow to the hands and feet. It's also reducing blood flow throughout the body. So that's just looking at breathing from one perspective, the biochemistry of breathing, breathe less air and see, does it change your body temperature? Wow. Wow. What would you call that technique, Patrick, in terms of just the first technique you've given us? So simple, but so important. So it's breathe light from a biochemical point of view. Okay, breathe light from a biochemical point of view. We're going to be talking about breathing today with, uh, I think, the foremost uh, expert on the topic and how it's changed my life. I must say it's been a difficult process to, to uh, continually practice in my life. You know, being a comrades runner, 11 comrades in a row now, it's something that uh, has been difficult for me to implement in my life. Uh, when I have, though, I found that it's been so beneficial just from a, a stress and a wellness point of view, Patrick. It's uh, your book, The Oxygen Advantage. I can recommend it to anyone. We'll put some links in terms of this book. But I found that it's been really uh, informative, but simple to understand, which is, you know, incredible for the, for the lay person to pick up, uh, not only the medical practitioner or the sports person that, uh, you know, if you understands physiology in that, but for the lay person to pick up. So I do want to start with, the, the, with some 10 big ideas. I want to build a bit of a story, a bit of a narrative in terms of why breathing is so important. And the first thing I want to discuss is just oxygen, how important it is to our cells, uh, to our brain cells, to all cells in our body, and how we can maximize the utilization of oxygen. Well, to maximize the utilization of oxygen, we have to bring, bear in mind, can we change our breathing patterns to improve oxygen uptake? 
And back in 1988, a researcher called Swift noticed that when patients following jaw surgery, when their jaws were, were wired shut and the patients were forced to continuously breathe through the nose, that the oxygen uptake in the blood increased by 10%. So nasal breathing can improve oxygen uptake in the blood, but nasal breathing also causes a resistance to breathing during, the wake during wakefulness that's two to three times that of the mouth. This slows down breathing. When you breathe through your nose, your breathing is slower. Slower breathing is allowing sufficient time for oxygen to diffuse from the, the lungs to the blood. Slow breathing and normal breathing also allows more normal carbon dioxide levels in the blood, and especially when you do physical exercise. So when you do physical exercise with your mouth closed, carbon dioxide does increase in the blood. And people don't realize that carbon dioxide is responsible or is a catalyst for the release of oxygen from the red blood cells to the tissues. Mm. Good. So you think of a runner with the mouth open. They are breathing fast and shallow. They have reduced oxygen uptake. They have reduced oxygen delivery. There's trauma to the airways. They're losing moisture and they're in a fight or flight response. Mm. Nose breathing is slow breathing. It's driven by the diaphragm. It increases oxygen uptake. It increases oxygen delivery. And working muscles can get, stay going for longer without tiring. There's less lactic acid. Um, because, of course, the, the body is staying or the muscles are staying aerobically for longer. The fraction of expired oxygen is less. The body is utilizing more oxygen. So in terms of breathing economy and breathing efficiency, nose breathing is vital for, you know, for blood flow and oxygen delivery. And I saw that with the runner who broke the two-hour marathon mark. He was breathing through his nose. I couldn't believe it at that level and that pace to, to maintain nasal breathing. You know, I think when yes. high-intensity interval training has been a battle for me to breathe through my nose. You, you want to huff, you want to puff, but the more you breathe through the nose and the more you the go easier the it gets. Stomach, the easier it gets. Uh, yes. Even the fight with Mayweather and uh, McGregor uh, in the yes. first round. Would you just expound on that? Because I, I see you nodding, so you uh, you probably agree yeah. with what I'm just about yeah. to say. But tell yeah. me. Yeah. Well, it was during that that fight was interesting in terms of the the commentary of it. And if you listen to the commentary, what the commentator said back in the seventh or eighth round, he said that McGregor is mouth breathing now. He's breathing hard, and he predicted McGregor was going to gas out. And I, I mean, can't remember exactly what round it was, but certainly you do see McGregor's legs going from under him. And that can be due to two things. It could be due to a buildup of hydrogen ion, or it could be due to respiratory muscle fatigue. Mm. So there can be an increase of hydrogen ion if there's not enough oxygen getting to the working muscles. And the hydrogen ion they get, they doesn't get oxidized if there's insufficient oxygen. So the hydrogen ion will associate with py pyruvic acid to form lactic acid, which will dissociate into hydrogen ion and lactate. So the hydrogen ion could be implicated in causing his fatigue, or he could have had respiratory muscle fatigue, that the breathing muscles can only do so much work. And at some point when they tire, blood is stolen from the legs to feed the diaphragm. So when the legs give out, it could be because of blood stealing by the diaphragm, because of course, the body wants to make sure that respiration is maintained. Mm. Breathing trumps other functions in the body. Mm. And other functions can be sacrificed in order to maintain respiration. Mm. So when the diaphragm fatigues, blood is stolen from the diaphragm, diverted from the legs to the diaphragm to ensure that there is sufficient blood flow to the diaphragm breathing muscle. And correct me if I'm wrong, there's a lot of studies to show and indicate that if you take two equal performing athletes and you train the one from a breathwork point of view and breathing techniques, they will perform better every single time just because their breathing apparatus and their oxygen utilization is better, correct? Well, it's very understudied. The science is starting to catch up. And um, we look at breathing from two different perspectives. If you look at the work of George Dallum, he's a professor of um, I think exercise science from one of the universities in the United States, but he's a well-known triathlete and he's also a trainer of Olympic athletes. He switched to nose breathing during all of his runs about four years ago, maybe five years ago. And in the last two years, he started investigating the science of what happens when you switch from mouth to nose breathing. Because until then, the few studies that were available were literally looking at a bunch of athletes 
asking the athletes for the first time ever to switch to nasal breathing mm. and then testing them switching to nasal breathing but it's the first time that they have done it yes. and as a result the results are not going to be good because when you first switch from mouth to nose breathing the air hunger is too much mm. and that increased air hunger is going to slow you down so what Dalam said was let's test athletes after they have maintained nasal breathing during all of their physical exercise for six months and then see what happens. And he got recreational athletes, 10 of them. Um, he spent two years trying to recruit athletes. And at the end of two years, he managed to recruit 10 individuals. So it goes to show the uptake in terms of nasal breathing during exercise performance. Nobody wants to do it because initially it's tougher. But this is the thing you're exposing the body to an extra load to force the body to make adaptations. Now, what were those adaptations that Dalham concluded in his paper? One was that ventilation was 22% less with nasal breathing versus mouth breathing. Ventilation was 22% less. That's a tremendous economical saving because we, you know, to support our breathing muscles, um, there is a loss of oxygen consumption in terms of when we sit down talk here, Stephen, 2% of our oxygen consumption is going to support our breathing muscles. If you do moderate physical exercise, it's about 5%. If you do intense physical exercise, it's about 10%. And if you do maximum physical exercise, it's about 15%. But if you are breathing inefficient during hyperventilation, it can increase to 30%. So there is a cost associated with breathing. Now, to be able to perform 100% of a work rate intensity, according to Dallum's paper, at six-month follow-up, nose breathing, but with 22% less ventilation. That's 22% less breathlessness. Wow. Now, what was also interesting was the, ink, the carbon dioxide in the blood was 44 millimeters of mercury with nose breathing versus 40 millimeters of mercury with mouth breathing. And the fraction of expired oxygen was less. In other words, more oxygen, while the individual was breathing in oxygen, that air, that oxygen was being delivered to working muscles. So they weren't breathing out as much oxygen. Their body was utilizing it. Okay. So that's one aspect of it. But even look at the, look at the work by Wurons, a researcher from Paris, from France. He has, from, since 2008, 12 years, of researching using breath holding on the exhale hold technique. And these are the exact same exercises that we have been teaching since 2002. Okay. You have an athlete take a normal breath in and out through the nose, hold their nose, and sprint for 40 meters on a breath hold. And then have a recovery of about 30 seconds with normal breathing and sprint again 40 meters on a breath hold. They tested this with rugby union players, elite rugby union players during competitive season in Australia. Their repeated sprint ability was nine, nine repeated sprints before exhaustion. They had the experimental group who were doing the 40 meter sprinting with breath holding. After four weeks, their repeated sprint ability increased from nine to 14.7. Wow. And the control group who were doing high intensity interval training, no change. Okay. So when you compare breath holding to high intensity interval training, there is no comparison. Here is the reason. When you do high intensity interval training, your blood oxygen saturation with nose breathing will drop down to about 91%. With mouth breathing, it will be about 93%. Carbon dioxide in the blood will stay relatively the same. It will change maybe one, two, maybe three millimeters of mercury. Not a lot. With breath holding, your blood oxygen saturation will drop down to the mid 80s. That's severe hypoxia. Your carbon dioxide will increase to above 50 millimeters of mercury. That is quite strong. It's hypercapnia. Breath holding is disturbing the blood acid base balance, forcing the body to make adaptations, including increased and improved buffering capacity inside in the muscle, the working muscle. So it's delaying lactic acid and fatigue. So, yeah, I think there are, there's quite a few studies now coming out. Wurons is certainly about 12, 15 papers just on the exhale hold technique. If you look at free diving, um, even if you look at a paper written back in 2010, it's called Apnea, a new training method in sport because athletes haven't been using breath holding or if they have been using breath holding, they have been breathing in and holding their breath. Whereas if you really want to get the gains, 
yeah. have a normal exhalation and hold your breath. So can I just simplify this because I'm an athlete and I think uh, there's a lot of uh, my listeners that are into performance that want to improve their performance because with that rugby union uh, paper, that's significant. That's a significant change from 9 to 14.7 just using yes. breath hold. So it's, it would be a breath through your nose and then so you a take, gentle breath out through your nose. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Then hold your nose. Then and hold Hold, hold your, your breath, nose. hold your nose. Well, you're better off holding your nose. You could do it just locking your throat, just holding your breath. Okay. So that you, so basically either hold or hold your breath. Yeah. And, then you and do sprint. You as hard as you can to sprint. maximize. Sprint. Yes. Sprint 40 meters on the breath hold after an meters. exhalation. Okay. Four zero. Four, Four zero. zero. Okay. Is that science and, based or is that empirical evidence? Um, in terms of the study, um, I'm not sure in terms of the, the paper itself. What I'll do is okay. I'll forward it on to you okay. sure. and uh, you can dig it out. So would you say then, what is the normal breath uh, intake? How many seconds? Is it a six seconds in generally through your nose and then a six seconds out and then you sprint for 40 meters? Would you say that? Well, normally what an individual, they will have normal breathing. So, you know, you're talking about two to three seconds in, three to four seconds out. Okay. So it's just a normal, it's a normal inspiration and expiration, normal breath in and out to functional residual capacity. So you're just taking a normal inhalation, normal exhalation, and then holding the breath and sprinting with the breath hold for 40 meters. Okay. All right. Sure. That's fascinating. That's something that uh, athletes out there and uh, those that want to improve their uh, the aerobic would it be aerobic and anaerobic fitness that you would improve well that would be improving anaerobic as well it's you know in terms of aerobic fitness when you do breath holding and um, the kidneys become hypoxic and with the result of the kidneys and the liver extent the liver to a lesser extent becoming hypoxic in other words there's not enough oxygen getting to those organs there's a whole hormone called erythropoietin or epo being synthesized and EPO is a, is a messenger in terms of signaling to the bone marrow to mature red blood cells. Mm. So some studies have shown that aerobic capacity increases, oxygen carrying capacity increases from doing breath tolling, but other studies have shown it didn't, it wasn't the case. But it, I think it's the same with high altitude training. Mm. There are some responders and there are some non-responders. So from an aerobic point of view, it seems plausible with some athletes, but that certainly that they can improve their aerobic capacity. And also a short-term improvement to aerobic capacity would be doing breath holding to have spleen contraction. Because your spleen is your blood bank. It contains about 8% of your red blood cells. And if you do five maximum breath holds, it forces the spleen to release red blood cells into circulation. And depending on whatever paper you read, it takes 10 minutes to 60 minutes for the spleen to reabsorb those red blood cells back. So if you have increased red blood cells, you've got increased oxygen carrying capacity. You're increasing hemoglobin, you're increasing hematocrit. This would show an increase to VO2 max. And if there's an increase of oxygen carrying capacity, you're able to stay aerobic for longer. Mm. So I think there is good potential in terms of breath holding as a training means or a tra mm. training mechanism for many sports. Um, team sports for you know especially for example mma fighters we we have a lot of our instructors some of them are mma fighters you know you wow. see the manual here in the front here um what other in terms of breath holding you know you can really apply these techniques like there's two aspects to breathing one is improved functional breathing that's your everyday breathing patterns because how you breathe during rest will determine how you breathe during physical exercise. And if you have an athlete and you measured their boat score, which is you take a normal breath in and out, hold the nose or hold the breath, and you're timing it in seconds until the individual feels the first definite desire to breathe. Yes. If the boat score is less than 25 seconds, one study that was prepared by a professor of physical therapy um, Professor Kiesel from the United States. If the bowl score is less than 20, sorry, if the bowl score is greater than 25 seconds, there is an 89% chance that dysfunctional breathing is not present. Okay. So if you have an athlete then with a bowl score of less than 25 seconds, this can manifest as premature breathlessness, 
excessive breathlessness, so they gas out too soon, respiratory muscle fatigue, and muscle fatigue because of insufficient oxygen delivery to the working muscles. So I think we need to look at it as to, in terms of two pillars. You've got functional breathing and you've got breath holding as a stressor. So functional breathing is improving your everyday breathing patterns and breath holding then is to force the body to make adaptations. Well, I think we've covered now breath holding. I think uh, the athletes and those that are want to optimize their performance can look at that breath holding technique. I'm definitely going to be be doing that and uh, pushing as hard as I can and see what happens to my data. Uh, I, what's interesting about the ordering, it gives you a respiratory rate. So it'll be very interesting to see what happens with people that have their, their respiratory rate while they sleep and after doing the technique, seeing if uh, things improve. But I do want to pivot right now to is a stressful crazy world out there that everybody knows about stress levels are at another level just from emotional uh, <coughs> points of view and just social and and uh, just uncertainty and instability in the market uh, and i think breathing could be one of the most important uh, factors with regards to engaging your parasympathetic nervous system yes. and sort of uh, you know counterbalancing the sympathetic drive of stress that it's hit a lot of people so tell us a little bit about the vagus nerve, vagal tone, and then maybe one technique for people to just, that can start today, right now, and say, listen, I want yes. to deal with these stress hormones. Um, I've got anxiety. I'm, I, I'm this uncertainty. What can I do from a breathing point of view, which is so important? So the vagus nerve is, is a nerve that's wandering from, from the area, from the brain, throughout the body. And it's, the vagus is based on va vagrant or va vagabond. In other words, it's a wandering nerve. And it's innervating many of the more essential organs in the human body. You can tap into the vagus nerve and stimulate it. And the vagus nerve is responsible for the parasympathetic approach. That there's feedback, 80% of the feedback from the vagus nerve from the body is going from the body to the brain. We can tap into the vagus nerve by simply slowing down the breath. And the best way to do it would be slowing down your breathing to a cadence of 5.5 .5 to 6 breaths per minute. What that does is it stimulates the vagus nerve, it increases vagal tone traffic, and it also increases or makes more sense to baroreceptors, which are pressure receptors in the major blood vessels. Those two mechanisms then seem to be feeding into heart rate variability. And traditionally, heart rate variability was the measure of vagal tone. Yes. Okay, so we can improve HRV and heart rate variability refers to the time between heartbeats, the or to or intervals. And, uh, you know, even in a simple way, people can <clears throat> determine the functioning of the, the autonomic nervous system, which is the automatic functioning of their body by simply locating their pulse. You know, they can locate it on the wrist or on their neck and looking at the synchronicity between their breathing and the pulse rate. And that as you breathe in, is the pulse rate getting faster or slower? And as you breathe out, is the pulse rate getting faster or slower? So on the inspiration, it's more sympathetically driven that the vagus, vagus nerve is stepping back. So on the inspiration, the pulse rate should be faster during rest. And on the expiration, the, it's, driven, it's parasympathetically driven that the pulse rate is slower, that the time between beats is longer. And it's a very good measure of the functioning of the autonomic nervous system. Individuals who are disturbed by stress, post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, depression, irritable bowel syndrome, chronic fatigue, asthma, um, hypertension, hypotension. And even you know, in terms of mental unwellness, but also physical unwellness, they tend to have reduced heart rate variability. Okay. So we can stimulate that. You could simply locate and put your hands either side of your lower two ribs. And as you breathe in, you breathe in for a count of four seconds. And you breathe out nice and relaxed for a count of six seconds. So you are breathing in two, three, four, out, two, three, four, five, in, two, three, four, out, two, three, four, five, in, two, three, four, out, two, three, 
four, five. Now, that is so simple. And what I say to people when they're doing it is, don't hear your breathing during rest, because if you're hearing your breathing, then you could be sacrificing the biochemistry. So you want to target the biomechanics with lateral expansion and contraction of the lower regions of the lungs. By breathing slower and fuller breaths, you increase, you, re, you stimulate the vagus nerve and especially to a cadence of 5.5 to 6 breaths per minute. So with that example, we breathe it in for four seconds yes. and we breathe it out for six seconds. Or you could breathe in for five seconds and breathe out for five seconds. Both have the same similar effect in terms of getting a balance between parasympathetic and sympathetic. Now, I would even talk about sleep because if you're sleeping with your mouth open, you are not going to have deep sleep or as deep a sleep as you should be. Your sleep will tend to be lighter. And mouth breathing is very, very common during sleep. You know, many people will say, well, I have my mouth closed all the time. Well, then the question is, do you have your mouth closed during physical exercise? Do you have your mouth closed during sleep? If you wake up with your mouth in the morning, if it's dry, if your mouth is dry in the morning, you're not having a restful sleep. You are more likely to feel lethargic. You're more likely to get up to go to the bathroom during the night. You have sleep disruptions. You are more likely to snore, more likely to have obstructive sleep apnea. And the thing about sleep is we have to restore nasal breathing. The top sleep doctor in the world is regarded to be Dr. Christian Guimano. He passed away about a year ago. And he was a Stanford-based medical doctor. He coined the phrase obstructive sleep apnea. And he also developed the main measurement of the severity of sleep apnea called the apnea hypopnea index. Now, I've spoken alongside Dr. Gimeno, different conferences over the years, mm. and he always emphasized one thing, the importance of nasal breathing during sleep. He wrote about it in many papers for pediatrics. He spoke about it at many, many conferences. And yet... This is being overlooked. People are told, have sleep hygiene. Don't be looking into your mobile phone. Don't be looking at smart light smart or smart television. Avoid blue light. Wear blue light filter glasses. Um, don't drink alcohol before you go to bed. Have the bedroom airy. Don't lie on your back and all of this stuff. It's all good stuff. But the elephant in the room is mm. breathe through your nose. Mm. I was a mouth breather for 20 years, 25 years. I was waking up chronically exhausted every single morning and you're supposed to go into school and get good grades grades and you know academic achievement is apparently a measurement of uh, intelligence well in, in a small sense it is but individuals and kids measurements of intelligence is, ga is gauged by their academic achievement but their academic achievement is influenced dramatically by their sleep and any child who is going into school tired they don't have the concentration, they don't have the memory recall, and they are not going to achieve good results. And we're saying that these kids are stupid. These kids might not be, they may not be stupid. Mm. These kids can be very intelligent, but because of mouth breathing and poor sleep, it's affecting their academic ability. And uh, yeah, there's plenty of studies on this. Karen Bonnick did a longitudinal study, 11,000 kids. It was published, I think, in 2011. And it showed that children who had sleep disorder breathing, and mouth breathing is a contributory factor to this, they had a 40% increased risk of special education needs if it was untreated by the age of eight. Yeah. So we really need to do this for children and for adults. Nose breathing, slow breathing, and diaphragmatic breathing is key. That's uh, really valuable. And uh, you know, I've got a 16-year-old and a four-year-old, and I'm trying to make sure that they breathe through their nose, keeping their nose air airway open. But just show us the tape that you've developed. And I mean, I think we, know we can use three mil sort of um, pour tape, but you've got something specific that uh, you can put yeah. in the mouth. And I think that's for, years, for years, we were using this tape here, mm. 3M micro pour tape. Yeah. Um, we always had an issue if people were, uh, if adults are anxious about it, they wouldn't wear the tape. Mm. People who are prone to anxiety and panic attack, people who are afraid that, you know, if they stop, you know, they won't mm. wear the tape. And also there's a perception about taping the mouth shut. Mm. Now with children, of course, we were trying to various different ways of getting the mouth closed. And this here is based on kinesio tape. Okay. So we call it, it's myotape because a lot of the people in the United States who use it, 
mm. um, are myo, myofunctional therapists. So okay. it's for dentists traditionally who were advocating nasal breathing in their children. Mm. So the tape goes as follows. It's stretchy, it's cotton, and you stretch it. This is the child size, so it's going to be quite tight on me. Mm. Okay, wow. Now, there's elastic tension here surrounding the mouth, which is bringing the lips together. And this, in turn, then is training the brain to restore nasal breathing. But there's no risk. The child, for children, we want to change the behavioral pattern in terms of mouth breathing. So we encourage the child to wear the tape for about 30 minutes to an hour a day while they're distracted, watching TV, etc. But the child can talk. And if the child forgets, they're mm. automatically reminded. So we're trying to generate or improve neuroplasticity in terms of we're changing the behavior there. With adults, of course, you know, for sleep and children for sleep, if a child was to get sick, they can open them out, mm. that there's minimal risk in terms of wearing that tape. Okay. But I mean, you could use it as a training device in the day. I mean, I look at that now to remind yeah. myself, you know, in time when I'm working and obviously walking around or doing whatever, just to make sure that I'm breathing through my nose until you're so used to it. Yes. Then that's it. on and at night and then almost yeah. it's a proprioceptive device back into the brain to tell the, yes. to the body how to breathe. And I mean, this is something that we don't teach our children. As you're saying, how important oxygen is for their developing brains, how important it is for them actually, you know, to get good sleep, deep sleep, REM sleep. It's yes. very interesting once the research comes out in terms of nasal uh, breathers, what happens to your rapid eye movement sleep and your deep sleep scores, your HRV scores. You know, I've been tracking my, my sleep data now for probably 14 months, and it's been incredible to see different variables and factors that influence our sleep. So this is something that I've really got to get from you, and uh, we'll make it available to, to my community. It looks like quite a nifty uh, sort of proprioceptive device and uh, a lot of them are used to or no K tape. So, well, thank you for that. But tell me now specifically when it comes to breathing, how many breathing sort of uh, hacks or tips or exercises should we be doing on a daily basis? You know, I mean, a lot of my listeners will probably, they meditate. What breathing techniques should they be doing on a daily basis? Well, in order to improve sleep, slow down your breathing for 15 minutes before sleep. Okay. and slow it down to the point of an air hunger. So that's a down regulation. Very important for people with insomnia, very important for activating a parasympathetic response, and very important for helping to lead to deeper sleep. So if the person is watching television, they can be just gently slowing down, really slowing down the speed of their breath, breathing hardly any air. Mm. Not by holding the breath or freezing the breathing, just by gently slowing it down. They will feel warmer, they will feel increased watery saliva in the mouth, which is an indicator of activation of a parasympathetic response. When we get stressed, the mouth goes dry. That's one. To decongest your nose, you can simply hold your breath. Don't do it if you're pregnant. Don't do it if you've got cardiovascular issues. Never do strong breath, never do breath holding to achieve a strong air hunger if you've got compromised health. Okay. In other words, if you have cardiovascular issues, high blood pressure, pregnant, um, type 1 diabetes, you'd have to be careful with it. Slow breathing is very beneficial for type 1 diabetes, but breath holding might lower blood sugar levels a bit too quick. So to open up your nose, and this has been written about since 1923, take a normal breath in and out through your nose, hold your nose, walk around, and walk around holding your breath, and keep walking until you feel a fairly strong air hunger, and then let go and breathe in through your nose, then breathe normal for about a minute, and repeat it five or six times. Your nose will be opened. The more you breathe through your nose, the more your nose opens. The problem with a stuffy nose is, if you have a stuffy nose, you are 1.8 times more likely to have a sleep problem. So children or adults, they don't just have a stuffy nose. So that's the second exercise. In terms of then slow breathing to activate the parasympathetic response, put your hands either side of your lower two ribs, and breathe in for a count of four seconds. So as you breathe in, your ribs are moving out, and breathe out for a count of six seconds. So you have a prolonged exhalation, which is helping to stimulate the vagus nerve. Okay. So it's the exhalation that activates the parasympathetic response. It's not the inhalation. And the other thing about that is, there was a paper that was published just, I think, January of this year, 
they exposed individuals to pain and they monitored their pain perception and they, they, they monitored it in comparison to different breathing cadences, spontaneous breathing where they were breathing normal and different breathing rates. And the rate of breathing that reduced pain was 5.5 to 6 breaths per minute, breathing in for four seconds and breathing out for six seconds. Oh, wow. So that breathing in for four and out for six, it also improves alveolar ventilation. Um, it's activating the parasympathetic response and it's a very efficient way to breathe. We are much better as human beings breathing fuller breaths but less of them instead of fast and shallow breathing. Fast and shallow breathing. If I see an athlete sitting in front of me, if I see him sitting down or her, and if I see her breathing is relatively fast, upper chest, no natural pauses between breaths, I don't even have to ask her how is she performing during physical exercise. I know she is going to gas out too soon. And the other thing about it is that this athlete could be training hard. Physical training does not change your breathing patterns because it's how you breathe during rest how you breathe during wakefulness that transfers into how you breathe during physical exercise. So I think we have to consider breathing in terms of physical performance. Wow, there's a lot of value there in terms of performance, in terms of managing your stress, uh, just general well-being, affecting uh, just your vagal tone. Wow, uh, I just want to thank you so much, uh, Patrick, for your time. I think we're going to link to a lot of the resources. There are a lot of sort of uh, papers that we'll get to to the listenership uh i thank you for that i'm going to get some of that tape i think uh, we'll get some adult and some kids to just start retraining my family a bit you know easier using that tape that feedback mechanism uh your book the oxygen advantage uh has been phenomenal in my life so i want to just thank you personally for that uh you know if you just had to leave you know three other than breathing, I mean, you've obviously in the space of performance and wellness and health, and you've seen a lot of people over time. You've lectured, you know, with world authorities. You know, what what other two most important biohacks or two important factors could you, you know, give my my listenership uh, in terms of just overall health and wellness? Well, I think the first thing is, and I was lucky enough, is to find an occupation that suits your skills. Mm. Um, I have an occupation that I love. It's very easy for me to spend a lot of time researching, keeping up to date with it. I love it. Mm. And that's one thing. Um, you know, I, I don't think enough emphasis is put on this during school years. Children are taught in school to be all rounders. We are not all rounders as individuals. There's some things that I'm good at and there's some things that I'm absolutely useless at. Mm. So, you know, teaching somebody to be an all rounder where that's not where we want to be in life. We all have certain talents and skills. We really need to be driving these kids to identify the skills and the talents that are most suited to them because it will surely make a massive difference in their quality of life. It's a huge difference in my quality of life. We spent 40 years working. Why not get an occupation that absolutely suits what our values are, our skill set is? The second thing is don't live stuck in the head. I live stuck in my own head 20 years, constantly thinking, thinking, thinking. You know, I was missing out on everything. I would be in beautiful scenery. I wouldn't be there at all. Mm. I was constantly worrying, constantly analyzing. We have been trained how to think. We haven't been trained how to stop thinking. And again, this again is something that should be taught in schools. You know, if we are teaching children how to analyze, how to decipher, how to reason, how to break information into tiny pieces, if we teach them how to think, we need to be able to teach them how to switch off. How do you stop thinking? And when you stop thinking, and I'm not talking about a forced stopping of the thinking, but I'm talking about the ability to bring stillness to the mind. Mm -hmm. The ability to bring stillness to the mind is a reflection of your ability to concentrate. How long can you hold your attention on something, on a subject matter for a period of time without distraction? My concentration has improved immeasurably. I'm 47 years of age than when I was 16 years of age because of better sleep, better breathing, and also by focusing on the breath and more present moment awareness. Right. By doing that, we are training the brain to be focused. And I will say this, smartphones, social media, if you are using them, 
use it very, very selectively. Don't live your life stuck in a phone because it will wreck your life. Okay, wow, that's fantastic. And that goes with the pillars that made you thrive, your purpose, your values, your skill set that you were created very uniquely to add a very specific essence to this world. And you need to tap into that as soon as possible, something we can teach the next generation to be very, very sort of uh, intentional and deliberate to find that purpose, find that why, find the greatest area of your life that will bring you meaning. And so thank you for that. And then secondly, silence and solitude and stillness to be able to switch off and just allow your, your, your mind to rest and repair and regenerate. So I want to thank you so much, Patrick. Uh, you've been a wealth of knowledge. Uh, your books, I think you've got eight books. It reminds me of, and maybe there'll be a part two, the magic spot that we can teach uh, our kids in terms of uh, where and how they can breathe. We may, can maybe do that on another podcast, but to teach yep. the next generation on, on how to breathe, to get them to wake up, and be able to concentrate, not with brain fog. And obviously, as we yes. get older, you know, we see sleep deteriorate for many, many reasons, and it shouldn't. You know, there's no reason we should accept the fact that as we get older, sleep deteriorates. But I think it's got to do a lot with our breathing, a lot with the stresses in, in our lives, the insults that attack us, you know, um, that affect our, our vagal tone and our HRV. And so, um, yeah, uh, I encourage my listeners to, to download this, distill it, uh, we're going to have some cool show notes. But before we leave, where can people find you? I know that you're a breathing coach. You're a Buteco uh, professor. Where can people reach you? How can they get more of your resources? Uh, how can they connect with you, Patrick? Um, in terms of children, we have uh, our children's program is completely free online. Wow. Wow. Um, if you go to butecoclinic.com and you find a link there, learn it, children. And all of eight exercises, everything Everything from the Buteco method for children is free. So all the kids have to do is sit down, listen to the videos. I'm working with my own child in it, um, and that's available for kids. I never wanted children to experience the fatigue, the wheezing, the breathlessness that I experienced as a kid because it held me back, and it, held, it holds you back in many levels. So that's one of the reasons that we put it out there. Um, for health, we have butecoclinic.com. And that's spelled B-U-T-E-Y-K-O, clinic.com. And we have a YouTube channel as well. All of the videos are free, of course, on YouTube. But the children's videos are also up on YouTube. So you could access them that way. And then for sports performance, for focus, for concentration, for resilience. Um, that is oxygenadvantage.com. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your dedication, your lifelong passion to... Uh, improving people's health through breathing. Obviously, you've got your own story that we didn't really have time. We've uh, run out of time with regards to your own history, but maybe we can do that in another part. I just want to personally thank you and just thank you for who you are and carry on going. You're only 47. It seems like you've got a wealth of knowledge uh, that far surpasses that age. And uh, keep writing. I've enjoyed your, your, your books and keep uh, teaching and uh, look forward to connecting again. And uh, if you've got questions and comments and you want to ask about breathing techniques, uh, then let me know. I'm always open to your queries and your comments and what you want to hear. I think this is an area that we're going to sort of delve more into because I think it's an area that is probably least taught and uh, something that's least practiced. I find it's been difficult in, in my own life to implement this breathing techniques, especially when I'm running and exercising, but uh, I've seen the value already. I've seen the value already. So thank you, Patrick. All the best to you and uh, uh, we'll catch up, catch up soon.